and a technological adventure this morning. So uh, no surprise that this wasn't, we even tested it and there was no sound. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be with you on this absolutely glorious day, 20 degrees cooler than it was a couple of days ago. And isn't, isn't that a blessing? There are, for those of you who may be here for the first time or newer, we do have bulletins that are, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not sick. <laughs> at, the, at the cart, which, uh, Nicole, would you, yep, that, right there. So if you'd like a bulletin, we do encourage you to uh, raise your hand or go by and get that. There are also blue welcome cards that are at that cart. And if uh, you are newer, we would love to have you fill one of those out and drop it in the offering box. Let us know who you are. And uh, if there are any questions we can answer, or any information that uh, you need, we would love to be able to do that. I want to uh, say a special word of welcome this morning to our preacher, who is Jim Coral. Uh, a familiar face to many of you, but uh, I think it's appropriate from time to time just to remind folks of our history with Jim. He has uh, served his entire ministry in this diocese. He has been a friend of St. James for a very long time. Uh, he was actually a regular preacher and officiant during the interim uh, prior to my call here 11 years ago. He and Nancy, who is right up here, Nancy, his wife, uh, have been worshiping at St. James ever since his retirement, sort of, your sort of retirement. And uh, Nancy is actually on the vestry. They have three beautiful daughters that we are blessed to see from time to time. And I consider Jim not only a colleague, but a friend. And he has a very powerful word for you this morning. Uh, given to him in his prayer and study and pondering on the readings for this morning. I do invite you now to stand and let us begin our worship in song. In the darkness, 
darkness. We are waiting without hope, without light. There is nothing we can do without God. So we praise Him. We praise the Father, we praise the Son. We praise ever the King of Kings. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated.
In this reading, Paul calls Christians to live in sobriety and wisdom amid the trials of evil. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand that the will of, the, of what the Lord, will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is a selection from Psalm 34. We'll read the psalm verses together. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. Come, children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You among, who among you loves life and desires long life to enjoy prosperity? Keep your tongue from evil speaking and your lips from lying words. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true life and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the series of gospel readings that occur at this time of the year, especially in the cycle that we're in right now, have to do with bread from heaven, the bread of life, and eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. All preachers struggle with these passages, especially as they go from week to week to week uh, with the same kind of sound to them. And so it was very wise of Becky Kerper to invite a guest preacher, <laughs> i.e. me, to wrestle with today's passage in her place. Well played. <laughs> Today's 
Today's gospel story is difficult to listen to and to comprehend. The crowd, the crowd was mystified by what Jesus said. Capernaum's synagogue leaders were offended by what he said. Who wouldn't be? Even Jesus' followers beyond the circle of the 12 found the message hard to take. After this, many of his disciples went away and accompanied him no more, John tells us. So what are we to make of these encounters that Jesus had with the people of Galilee? Well, in order to get a handle on this, we must look at what we just heard in the gospel in context, which is always a good idea when you're reading the scriptures anyways. So let's back up a bit to the beginning of our chapter. Jesus was somewhere across the Sea of Galilee from Capernaum teaching a crowd of people. It got late in the day, so Jesus turned to his disciple Philip and asked him where they might find food to give to the people. Philip had no idea, but Andrew saw a young boy with five loaves of bread and two fishes. But Andrew wondered what good that would do. Well, you know the rest of the story, if you know your scriptures at all, how Jesus took the bread and the fish and fed 5,000 people with it. At the end of the day, his disciples got in the boat and went across the lake to Capernaum. It was getting close to the Sabbath, so they planned to attend synagogue there. Jesus walked off by himself into the hills and finally caught up with his disciples in Capernaum. The crowd went looking for Jesus because, as Jesus noted, he had fed them with real food, with bread, satisfied their physical hunger. Jesus uses this incident to teach about bread from heaven, in effect saying to them, you came here looking for me because you received physical bread and were satisfied. I am offering you bread from heaven. They did not get it. He says that the bread from heaven is standing right in front of you. They still did not get it. The scene then moves into the synagogue of Capernaum where the crowd continues, continues to press Jesus and where there is now an encounter with synagogue leaders. They have obviously heard about the feeding of the 5,000 and the crowd's reaction to it. The leaders begin to question Jesus about his teachings. And at this point, we enter the gospel message, the gospel passage that we heard just a few moments ago. Jesus says to them, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. They are deeply offended by that and too by the other things they had been saying. The first problem that both the crowd and the synagogue leaders had was one of literalism. They were hung up on bread, physical bread, the stuff that feeds people's stomachs, the stuff that, that Jesus fed people with, and how it related to their own history of having been fed by God through Moses at the time of the Exodus. They were trying to get those two things kind of squared up, if you will. When Jesus began to talk about bread from heaven, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, at first they were lost, and then secondly, offended by the images that he used. In working our way through all of this, there is a temptation to be hard on Jesus' questioners. But I think if we were in the synagogue that day and of that culture at time, maybe even if we are of our own time, we might well have been right in the middle of those same questions and might well have been baffled and even offended by the images that Jesus used. Eat his flesh, drink his blood, really? So Christians of deep faith have continued to wrestle with those images and the things that Jesus said to understand what it meant and to embrace the broader life-giving message. Though we live in a different world, we can sympathize with that crowd and with the, with the leaders of that religious community. 
Truly, one lesson we must take from these stories is that we must avoid getting hung up in the literal aspect of the teaching too. Sometimes Jesus uses similitudes, illustrations, and other devices in order to teach his audiences. But earlier Christians, as well as later Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, and Lutheran communities, readily understand Jesus' words as referring to the Eucharist, the Holy Communion. Though at the time that Jesus spoke these words, the Eucharist had not yet been instituted. But I'd like to suggest, as true as that is, that if we stop there, by seeing these encounters solely as an attempt on the part of Jesus to introduce a teaching that would only be come to have meaning later, after his death and resurrection, we might find ourselves coming into kind of a blind spot or a cul-de-sac. Ah, this is what it meant. QED, full stop. As with everything that Jesus says and does, we are, however, called to move in much deeper, much deeper than that. Eat my body, drink my blood, life. The whole internal context of these incidents is about bread and eating. It's not simply about bread or eating. It is about faith. It is about absorbing what Jesus has to offer. The question for us has to do with what is at the very center of our lives. Who or what is our guiding star? What do we hunger for? What values and practices drive our lives and the way we treat other people? What internal machinery do we use to give ourselves permission to do things or to excuse ourselves from do, doing things or to excuse ourselves from the things that we've already done? What is our core value? For example, I would argue that our core culture's core value is most likely money. One is permitted to do almost anything if it involves making money or saving money. For Christians, our core values are found in our relationship with Christ. We seek to form ourselves after him, after his core values and practices, even when there is a cost for us. We take in those values and we absorb them, we make them our own, so that in the process we may become his. There is a saying, you are what you eat, or you become what you eat. And I'm sure you've heard that phrase and recognize that it doesn't simply speak about food or eating in a literal sense. It has to do with those life experiences and lessons that we've learned with habits that we act out day by day that form and shape our lives and the kind of people that we become. Let me offer you a couple of personal examples. My father was a very simple and traditional man. He was one of eight children. He had an eighth grade education and worked as a shift worker all of his life. My parents were married 63 years when he died in 2004. I learned a lot from him about being a coral, as he used to like to say, and really about how to become a man. My father had a saying that he repeated to me as often as I needed to hear it, or as frequently as needed until he was satisfied that I really heard it. That phrase was, you will respect your mother. I was not allowed to talk back to her. I was not allowed to blow her off. I was not allowed to dress improperly around her in the house. You will respect her mother. And so it is that I absorbed this teaching into my soul. It has shaped my life imperfectly, to be sure, and it has shaped my way of relating to women, including my wife and my three daughters. I took on and in a sense absorbed, I became that core value that Jack Coral kept holding up to me. 
another example. My mother was a very religious woman, but in a um, German sort of quiet and kind of distant sort of way, uh, at least until sometime late in her 94 years. When I was growing up at home, whenever I did something egregious, something that was a serious violation of behavior, my mother would say to me, you know you have to talk to God about this when you go to church on Sunday. She meant that and expected that I would follow through, and I did. So from her, I learned the characteristics of being honest with myself and being honest with God. Those characteristics, truthfulness and honesty, were taken into my soul, absorbed, and helped to form and shape me as a person beginning at an early age because of Marie Coral. I am so very grateful for the parents that I had. I must be honest, however, I have not always lived up to those principles as I should have. And when I haven't lived up to them, I've always regretted it. But I know what is expected of me as a man and as a human being. There's something woven into me that pushes me and calls me, moves me in those directions that they taught. Respect your mother, be honest with yourself, be honest with God. So what difference does this make? Well, here's one way to think about it. This week, New York State Attorney General Letitia James released a report crafted over a period of five months that revealed for all to see accusations made by at least 11 women of their experiences with our state governor. The refuted actions and the claims that he sexually harassed those women created a toxic workplace and retaliated against those who objected to shocking, or should be shocking, to every one of us. This report, of course, led ultimately to his resignation. I read his resignation statement, the whole thing. In it, he denied the allegations, minimized the experiences of the women, and claimed that the rules had been changed under him, that they had changed in recent years, but that he was living from another generation. In effect, he claimed that he was only guilty of a genera generational boundary violation. So inside of me, given the way that I was raised, the way my core values were formed in me, here's what I have to say. Governor, you are right. Your behavior is not acceptable to the current generation. But I have news for you. It was not morally acceptable to your generation either, or to my generation. It has never been acceptable, no matter that some men have be behaved in this boorish way since the beginning of time. And minimizing what you have done, reportedly done, and dismissing the reactions of those 11 women only compounds what you have done. This has never been right and will never be right. You will respect your mother. You must be truthful with yourself and with God. When Jesus tells his disciples and the crowd and the synagogue leaders that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood, he is certainly making a Eucharistic reference. That's certainly clear. But he's saying much more than that. He's telling them, he's telling us to invite him to enter deeply into our very self, into our very being, to continue to begin, if needed, to do a transformation of who we are into his image and living presence. Like my parents' values planted my life so long ago that changed the kind of person that I would have been, and believe me, they did. Christ's life in us will also change the people we are and are to become. Nothing less, my friends, is worthy of him. The world needs Jesus in the flesh, needs our world to eat his flesh and drink his blood in this sense, to be transformed in this way. What might that look like? Well, here is what Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, who was martyred in the year 258, wrote, of all places, in a treatise on the Lord's Prayer. 
Humility in our daily lives, an unwavering faith, a moral sense of modesty in conversation, oops, justice, fairness in acts, mercy in deed, discipline, refusal to harm others, a readiness to suffer harm, peaceableness with one another, a wholehearted love of God, preferring nothing to him who preferred nothing to, uh, to us, clinging tenaciously to his love, standing by his cross with loyalty and courage whenever there is any conflict involving his honor and name, manifesting in our speech the constancy of our profession and under torture, which he suffered, confidence for the fight and in dying the endurance for which we will be crowned. That is what it means to wish to be a fellow heir with Christ. My friends, <clears throat> this will not happen if we, his heirs, do not step it up. To do that, we must eat his flesh and drink his blood in Eucharist and in life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jim, for sharing so boldly and passionately the word that God put on your heart this week. It occurs to me as we prepare to say the words of the Nicene Creed that we say every week that we are not meant to say them mindlessly as something that we simply assent to intellectually, but we are meant to say them in a sense as a prayer and allow them to uh, sink deeply into our hearts and our lives so that we might be changed. And I invite you now to stand and pray these words with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. In the Diocese of Central New York, we pray for our Bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. D.D. D. Duncan Proby and the people of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Arabia and their priest, the Reverend Perry Muncie. 
We also pray for the people of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in New Berlin and their priest, the Reverend Steve White. In our companion diocese of El Salvador, we pray for the people of San Jorge and Ucatala. In the Episcopal Church, we pray for our presiding bishop, the most Reverend Michael Curry, and the people of the Diocese of Missouri, and their bishop, the Right Reverend Dion Johnson. And in the Anglican Communion, we pray for the people of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, and their prime bishop, the most Reverend Tabo Macabo. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and for all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed for elected and appointed leaders, that they would serve the common good, unite the human family in bonds of love. God of freedom. God of justice, we pray for the earth, your creation entrusted to our care. Stir up in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave to our children's children the legacy of abundance that you have given us. God of justice. God of peace, we pray for this community, for our schools, neighborhoods, and workplaces. Give us courage to strive for justice and equality among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, for the lonely and those who mourn, and for those we name now, silently or aloud. Jones who's swallowing. Meaning. Awaken in us compassion as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. God of mercy. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, for those lost to the pandemic, for military personnel and public servants who have given their lives in service to our nation, and for those we name now. Cameron, George Byron. God of grace, hear our prayers, holy God. Breathe your spirit over us and all the earth that the barriers would crumble and divisions cease. Make us more fully your co-healers of the broken world. Unite us with all people in bonds of love that the whole world and earth and all its peoples may be at peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning again. It, it is just the greatest joy to uh, continue seeing faces that we haven't seen in a long time as folks make their way back to church and to see uh, new faces and those who are joining us um, perhaps for the first time. We just a really warm welcome to everyone. We are asking people uh, inside the church building to wear masks, and the purpose of that masking is to do our part in slowing the Delta variant. And uh, for the time being, I am uh, continuing the practice of greeting folks after the service, but uh, Jim, neither Jim nor I will be hugging or shaking hands to reduce any possibility that either of us might contribute to the spread of the coronavirus. So we just ask your understanding about that. I'm really thrilled to say that the second Sunday 
in September, we will kick off the fall season as we usually do, but we will also be restoring the 730 service to the Sunday morning schedule. In the meantime, this service, the 1045, will continue outdoors through September as long as the weather holds. I couldn't help uh, but in thinking about Jim's sermon and the way in which as followers of Christ, it is about um, being transformed, being changed into the image of Christ, that we have two baptisms this coming week, uh, two little girls who will be baptized into the family of God uh, for the purpose of life change and for the purpose of changing the world. And unfortunately, during this time of pandemic, uh, we are, baptisms have been private for the sake of the children who are unvaccinated, but I do, uh, commend these two little girls to you for prayer. Uh, one is uh, Amelia Jean Emmons, and she is going to be baptized in the lake on Tuesday, and Alyssa Faith Bellino, who will be baptized in the church on Saturday afternoon. There is uh, an offering box that is up at the cart for those of you who may have brought your offering. And again, I do invite anyone who is here for the first time or newer in our midst to fill out a blue card that you'll find up at the cart and put that in the box so that we can, we know who you are and if there's some way that we can connect with you, we'd love to be able to do that. We have been talking about the importance of this date today since the end of June. We are going to be celebrating Toppy Bates ministry here, 17 years. And uh, for those who are able to join us at five o'clock in the nave, you are welcome to do so, but we will also be live streaming it on the St. James Facebook page and um, to encourage you one way or the other to um, be present with us. It will also be recorded if for whatever reason that time isn't convenient for you, um, you'll get to, you'll still get to see it. We have some surprises for her. It would uh, not be right not to have a few surprises and some um, things we're gonna present to her. So I hope you're able to join us. This morning uh, for communion, we'll have two stations here at the bottom of the hill um, after we have said the prayers of consecration, Jim and I will each provide a station where you can receive bread and we, uh, the ushers will be stationed up the hill um, before them. We ask that you get a, I'm now calling it a dollop of hand sanitizer on your way down um, before you receive the bread. And if you are seated at the top of the hill and, or for any reason are uncomfortable um, trying to traverse this terrain, um, please do let the ushers know and we will happily come to you um, at the close of communion. We have a very exciting list of birthdays this week. Um, Pete Thomas had a birthday, Jean Gannon, Lily Sven, Nathan Samhammer. You wanna stand up, Nathan? Or at least wave, Nathan is turning seven, six. Nathan is turning six this week. Jameson Palin, Adrian Coker is turning, is he turning six or seven? Six. So Adrian lives in South Carolina. Well, he lives down there. <laughs> you would think I would know the difference. Um, he lives in North Carolina. He lives away from here. Uh, but he comes to church on Sunday and, come and does the children's program. And so he uh, is Danielle and Michael Larkin's nephew. And we're just delighted that he has a birthday this week. And Laura Pesesnik. She's turning a little more than six. Seven. A little more than seven. Is there anybody else who is celebrating a birthday or an anniversary would love to? Yes. Who, who, is it a birthday or an anniversary? Whose birthday? Yours. Well, happy birthday. So we are gonna pray for you as well. And um, if you would open up your bulletin to the top of page five, we're gonna say um, this birthday and anniversary blessing together. May the strength of God pilot you. May the power of God preserve you. May the wisdom of God instruct you. May the hand of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. May the shield of God guard you against the snares of evil and the temptations of the world. 
and may the Spirit of God bless you in the coming year. I'm going to uh, pass the piece. I just invite you to be conscious of the fact that some people are not ready to be hugged or shake hands, so just be um, mindful when you're approaching folks, but, but we don't want you to be um, reserved about sharing the love of Christ with one another. So the peace of the Lord be always with you.
understanding as you are able. Let us let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. This is the table of Jesus. It is prepared for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. It is not I who invites you, but Christ the Lord, and it is his longing that you meet him here this day. The congregation may be seated.
Standing as you are able, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
May the heavens bless you. May the sun shine on you. May the rain dance on your upturned face. May the stars make you wonder and smile. May the bounty and beauty of the earth bless you and may you bless the earth in planting and protest and sharing food. And may God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. God's world. Go and be creative. Go and work for justice. Go and love your neighbors. Go and walk with God. Amen. Alleluia.